So before I get started with, with this talk, I just want to say, uh, first of all, this is thanks to Jeff and Rod. This has been really a terrific um, conference. I'm not going to speak about type 2 diabetes. And trust me, it's very hard for me not to talk about it because I deal with it quite a lot. But I just wanted to say also, uh, same as Eric, that we also do a clinic that is very much focused on type 2 diabetes, as well as the treatment of, of obesity. And if anybody you know, is interested, they're also welcome to come see me. And you know, I'd be happy to have them sit in on my clinic as well. So it's important to kind of spread the knowledge. I work things slightly differently than um, Eric. But you know, the, 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 the bottom line is the same. So we use LCHF. We also use intermittent fasting. Uh, but today, I'm going to talk more about obesity. Um, so type 2 diabetes is very closely related, but there are intricacies about it that are, uh, you know, uh, not the same. So what I really want to focus on, uh, on is the etiology of obesity. And what etiology means is the underlying cause of obesity, okay? Because this is really an important question, okay? And this is... Um, something that has always bothered me and really one of the important paradoxes that kind of started me on, uh, on thinking of that. This is a very important paradox, right? Why are there fat doctors, right? Because we consider <laughs> that doctors are experts in nutrition, right? We know that's not true, but we think that, right? You either have, if you have both the knowledge and the ability, how is it possible? Well, there's only two possibilities. Right? You either don't have the ability or you don't have the knowledge. And this is really the most important question in weight loss. What is it that's causing weight gain? Right? What causes obesity? What is the etiology of obesity? Right? That is the question. Because if you get that question wrong, everything you do after that is wrong. Everything. All your treatments are wrong. All your drugs are wrong. The way you think about obesity is all wrong. And I think that we have everything all wrong. Well, it's too many calories, right? That's obvious. We've been told this since we we're in grade two that it's too many calories causes obesity, right? This is the whole idea. Calories in, calories out, a calorie's a calorie, right? The problem is, I think, that idea is completely and utterly incorrect. So this leads to this sort of energy balance paradigm, right? Which uh, companies like Coca-Cola, they love this sort of uh, energy balance paradigm, this kind of scale of uh, too much uh, you know, calories in or too few calories out. You know, and they all invoke this first law of thermodynamics, right? And if you've never heard it, it's that, oh, calories can't be created. The total energy of a system is constant. You can't create it and you can't destroy it. Therefore, it's either calories in or calories out. Now, there's really two major problems with this. And uh, one of the, and we'll get into that, but the, one of the real problems is we know that this kind of paradigm actually doesn't work at all. Okay? And it's not just me that's saying it. One, studies show it that the failure rate of this sort of eat less, move more is about 99%. So you're virtually guaranteed to fail, right? Virtually. Uh, if you look at books like the Handbook of Obesity, and so Jocelyn's Diabetes Mellitus, which is one of the very authoritative textbooks of medicine, um, it says, well, reduction of caloric intake is the cornerstone of any therapy for obesity, right? Reduce your calories, right? Caloric reduction is the primary thing. However, they say none of these approaches has any proven merit, right? That is to say, I'm telling you, to reduce your calories, but I know it doesn't work. OK, well, that's not very good advice. Unfortunately, it's actually the advice everywhere, right? Department of Agriculture, USDA, Handbook of Obesity, Jocelyn's, any textbook you read will say the same thing. So there's really two fundamental errors in this whole idea of calories in, calories out, right? The first one is that we've confused what the proximate cause and the ultimate cause is. And the second we touched a little bit upon yesterday, but I'll review it, is that they consider calories to be a single compartment and obesity is really a two compartment problem. That is, there are different ways for your body to use that energy that you put in. You can burn it or you can store it as fat, right? So there's two different pathways. And what's important is which way you go, not the total energy of the system. 
But let's talk first about proximate versus ultimate causes. So what approximate cause? Proximate means the most close to. So if you're worried about obesity, the proximate cause of obesity is too many calories, right? That's the thing that goes right before it. But the thing that ultimately causes it is the ultimate cause, okay? So the thing is, if you treat the proximate cause, it's kind of futile. It doesn't really work. If you treat the ultimate cause, because that's what's really underlying this disease, that's what is important. So let me give you some examples, right? So alcoholism, right? You can say alcoholism is too much alcohol in or too little alcohol out, right? <laughs> now that's a fundamental law, right? It's the first law of thermodynamics of alcohol, right? You cannot create or destroy alcohol. So if you tell me that's wrong, then you're saying that the fundamental laws of nature don't apply, right? Well, obviously that's not true, but that's the same argument that people make for calories, right? That's only the proximate cause, right? That's not the ultimate cause, and treatment is futile. If you say that, oh, you're an alcoholic, I have advice for you, drink less alcohol. <laughs> well, you'd say, well, that's pretty bad advice, right? So what's the ultimate cause of alcoholism? Well, it's lots of different things. Addiction, family stressors, an addictive personality. All of these things are the ultimate cause of alcoholism. So if you think about that for a second, now you can actually treat the disease because you know what the ultimate cause is, right? So the treatment is not telling somebody to drink less alcohol. The treatment is support groups like Alcoholics Anonymous, family help, social work, friends, church, religion, all of these things are crucially important. And you're not breaking this alcoholic first law of thermodynamics, right? Because it's ridiculous. That's only the proximate cause. You can take the same thing as a plane crash, right? What causes a plane crash? Well, the proximate cause is there's too much gravity or too little lift, right? It's a fundamental law of nature, right? So therefore, the Treatment is to have bigger wings or cut the weight on your plane, right? Well, that's pretty ridiculous as well. But again, advice to get bigger wings is you don't say, well, you're ridiculous because you're, you're, you're contradicting the fundamental law of gravity, right? That's only the proximate cause. That's not what causes it. That's what immediately precedes the plane crash, right? The ultimate cause is things like human error, weather or mechanical problems, right? So the um, government makes sure that people get adequate training, they have maintenance, and they have proper weather forecasting, right? And that makes sense because that's the ultimate cause. When you treat the ultimate cause, it's useful. When you treat the proximate cause, it's useless. So we can actually apply this pretty easily to obesity, right? So here's the way we think about obesity. Too much calories causes obesity, right? That's what everybody says, but that's really just the proximate cause. If you treat that, you're going to say eat less or move more, right? But what's the ultimate cause? So this is the first law of thermodynamics, but it's also the unspoken accusation, right? And again, one of these things that I think is one of the most unfair things about obesity is that what we say is that this is the proximate cause, but the ultimate cause is it's your fault, right? That's the unspoken accusation. You let yourself go, right? It's your fault. You shouldn't have eaten that bagel, right? It's all treatment is willpower. That's all you need, right? That's what they say, right? But the model is incorrect, right? It's only correct if this model is correct. There's another model of hormonal obesity, which treats obesity as a hormonal problem, right? So again, the proximate cause is still too many calories. But what's driving you to have too many calories? Well, it's insulin. Cortisol as well. It's hormones. So in this case, if you have a hormonal view of obesity, then the treatment is not willpower, right? Because all of a sudden, as a nation, you know, we're 50 years later, we have no willpower. And 50 years before, we had lots of willpower. Like, that's ridiculous, right? <laughs> so the treatment then 
is to lower insulin, right? And then you have to understand, then you can understand why it's going to work. So remember that in, in, this, in this hormonal model, you're not breaking any laws of thermodynamics, right? You're not saying that you're creating energy out of nothing, right? And this is the, one of the things that's always leveled at these low-carb um, uh, people. It's like, well, what? You don't believe in the law of thermodynamics? No, we're not saying that at all, you idiot. It's, <laughs> we're saying that there's a different cause. It's not willpower, it's insulin. That's what's causing you to gain weight, right? So they never understand that, but calling names is not the answer. No. <laughs> Um, the other issue is that, again, they've fundamentally misunderstood the problem. And obesity <coughs> weight gain is a two-compartment problem. And what it means is that it's not simply a matter of the energy in and the energy out, right? It's not simply what goes in and what goes out. Because you can think of yourself, um, I'm going to use a different analogy today. So think of yourself as the manager of a coal-burning power plant. Right? So every day you get 2,000 calories, 2,000 tons of coal, and you burn 2,000 tons of coal. But that's not the only place it can go. You can also store some of it right, in the storage shed. Right? So there's two compartments. And what's important is which way you go. It's not the total amount of energy. Because what happens if you decrease the energy in? So instead of getting 2,000 calories, 2,000 tons of coal, you're only getting 1,500 tons of coal, right? So we all assume that your stores go down. Well, that's only true, only true, if the amount you're burning stays constant. And that, as we saw yesterday, is simply not true, OK? That's the only way it is true. The other possibility is that as you reduce the amount of coal that's coming in, you reduce the amount of power you're burning, and you keep this stable. Again, you're not breaking any laws of thermodynamics. It's a problem with partitioning of energy, right? And this is the problem, right? So suppose you uh, are in this situation where you get 1,500 tons of coal, right? And then, so for a while, you take it out of your stores. You burn 2,000 tons of coal. You're getting in 1,500. So day after day, you're burning more than you take in. Well, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to run out of stores. Your, your, your body is going to totally shut down. You can't make any power. And there's blackouts everywhere, right? Boss says, get in here, you idiot. What are you doing? That's crazy, right? You'd never be so stupid as to do that, right? The logical thing is to simply make a little bit, burn a little less energy, right? Yeah, there's a few brownouts, but there's no blackouts. There's no looting, right? So that's the thing. You can do either, but which one actually happens? Well, the thing is that we've studied this for 100 years, and we know exactly what happens. OK, so this was back in 1917 they reduced the calories to like 1,400 to 2,100. So it doesn't seem that low compared to modern standards. But what they saw was this was a 12 young men, and they reduced their calories about roughly 30%. Because they wanted to know what happened, right? And what happened was that their metabolism decreased about 30%. Well, that's pretty smart. Because if you don't, you're going to run out of energy, and then you'll die. This body doesn't want to die, right? And this was shown in Ansel Keys' famous study. Right? We all talk about Ansel Keys for other reasons. But he did this very famous study on these conscientious objectors, right? people who didn't want to, go to, want to go to World War II. He took them. He reduced their calories by about 30 40%. Now, he actually kept reducing them to keep making them lose weight. And everybody always points this out as a reason why you shouldn't fast. But this was not fasting. Actually, this was a calorie-restricted diet. So these people we're eating about 1,570 calories a day. So it's not fasting. It's not starvation. It's a calorie-reduced diet. And what happened? Well, what happened was that their metabolic rates decreased by about 40%. Pretty logical. You're taking in less energy. You're burning less energy, right? So you, they measured all kinds of stuff. It was actually a terrific study. Heart volume shrank. Stroke volume shrank. Heart rate slowed. 
Um, the, the one thing everybody noticed was the body temperatures drop. So they said it's the middle of July and I'm putting on blankets, right? There's also all kinds of neuropsychiatric things. People obsessed about food and some went crazy and that kind of thing, right? And it's actually funny because these people were eating on average 1,570 calories a day, which is not that far off of what most diets do. But again, the point is that when you reduce calories in, calories out also reduces. And we've shown this in more recent studies. So this is Dr. Leibel's very famous study. And what he did was he took uh, patients with a stable weight and he put them into a metabolic lab, right? So he did two things. One is that he actually force fed them so that they gained 10% of weight. Then he put them back to normal, then he made them lose weight. And he measured their metabolic rates all through. So what did he find? Well, if you force feed these people and they gain 10% of weight, they increase their basal metabolic rate by close to 500 calories a day. So the body's not just gaining weight, gaining weight, gaining weight, right? So everybody says, yeah, you eat more calories, you're gonna gain weight. Well, no, your body is actually trying to burn it all off. 500 calories a day, right? And what happens to those very same people as you bring them back to their initial weight? Well, their basal metabolic rate goes back exactly the same. And as they lose weight, they start burning less energy. So they decrease their metabolic rate by about 300 calories, right? So again, it makes total sense. If you're getting a lot of coal delivered to you, right, and you just keep shuttling it into the stores, and eventually there's no more place to store it, so you stick it in your boss's office, right? What is he going to do? He's going to fire you, right? He said, why are you so stupid, right? Again, the body's just not that stupid, right? It's going to burn off all this energy because it doesn't want it, right? And that's exactly what happens. So it's a two-compartment problem. You have to see which way you're going. So this is our big hope, right? So you lose weight, and then you hope, well, you know, your meta metabolism is going to go down. We know that's going to happen. But maybe if you maintain this weight for a long time, your body kind of gets used to this new weight, right? That's our big hope. Unfortunately, it's not really true. So if you look at long-term studies, so up to a year, where they've maintained the weight loss, what you see is that the metabolic rate drops by about 400 calories a day, right? So it never got better, right? So it maintains itself indefinitely. So it looks like this is what happens when you try to reduce calories. And that's why caloric reduction really doesn't work, right? And we, we know why, it, we, we, know, we, we already know that it doesn't work, right? Because we've all done it, right? But we know why it doesn't work. The other issue, the other hormonal change that we get when you start to reduce calories is that you change your hormones, your satiety hormones and your hunger hormones. So again, this was published uh, in 2011, so about five years ago. And this was a study where they took people and they made them lose weight. And they maintained it over a long period of time. And then they measured their hormones and said, after one year, um, let's look at what, what's happening. Okay? So again, the hope is that as you get used to this new weight, that your um, body will just kind of settle down and be normal at this weight. But it doesn't. So ghrelin is the so-called hunger hormone. It's a hormone that makes you hungry. So even one year after, right, at week 62, so a year after weight loss, your ghrelin is much higher than it was before. Peptide YY is a satiety hormone. It makes you full. So if it's lower, it means you're more hungry, right? And again, even after a year, your satiety hormone is lower than normal, right? So the bottom line is that you're a lot hungrier, right? Because you've lost the weight and you haven't adjusted, all you've done is reduce calories. You haven't fixed the actual problem of insulin. So you're hungrier. And again, this always strikes me as one of the most unfair things in medicine. Because you're hungrier, like you're eating more, you want to eat more. But it's not because you're some gluttonous slob, right? It's because your hormones are making you hungry and you're burning less energy. So as you regain that weight, everybody 
thinks, oh, you went off your diet because you have no willpower, right? And again, one of the most unfair things in medicine because we know it's all about your metabolism, which went down, and your hunger hormones, which went up. But it all stemmed from a complete misunderstanding of obesity. So it's not a lack of willpower, right? You're not some glutton. It's, no, it's your hormones that are making you hungry. And you're not some slob because you're not exercising. You're like burning like 500 calories a day less. Not because you don't want to and because you're not exercising. It's your hormones. It's your basal metabolism has gone down. Now we know this happens, right? So again, if you look at this caloric reduction as primary model, which we use all the time, right? Too many calories, it's your personal choice. It's not actually true, right? It's all due to these metabolic adaptations because of the reduced energy expenditure and the increased hunger. And again, this is a, the, the study I referenced yesterday. We know this happens because this humongous trial of the Women's Health Initiative, which is 50,000 women. So here they start off baseline, 1,788 calories a day at follow-up seven years later. It's 1,445. You lost 361 uh, calories every day, day after day. And they gave them more fruits and vegetables and fiber. If you look at um, energy, uh, what they did, of course, was they, they, they did about a 50% carbohydrate diet, right? So they went up from 44.5 to 52.7. And if you look at fat, right, fat went from 38.8 to 29.8. Great. Terrific. Low calorie, low fat diet, right? Love it. What happened? Well, it didn't work, right? These people who should have get lost 36 pounds every single year didn't even lose a single pound like in 10 years almost, right? Not a single pound. They should have lost like, you know, 210 pounds of fat. And they lost nothing, right? Nothing, right? It's not even, this is one, one kilogram. So you're probably talking about like a quarter of a pound, you know, the weight of a good bowel movement or something like that, right? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> So we've known it for so long, and yet we keep telling people over and over and over, reduce your calories, reduce your calories, exercise more. We know it doesn't work. I could have told you that. And this, again, is the cruel hoax, right? This is the cruel hoax because we, we, we put the blame on people when the blame should be on ourselves, on the advice that we give, which is so poor. So you eat less calories. You lose weight, right? Your body senses that you lose weight. So you decrease your metabolism and you increase your hunger, right? Then you regain that weight. But since you have a lot of willpower, you double down, right? You're going to eat even less calories, right? And we've all done this. So you lose a bit more weight, but the problem is your body adjusts again. It reduces its metabolism and increases your hunger. And you start to regain the weight. It keeps going on and on and on until you can't take it anymore because you feel lousy. And the weight's still coming back. That's the cruel hoax, right? And then, to top it off, everybody thinks, oh yeah, that guy, he couldn't stick to his diet. You know, the most unfair, like the most cruel thing we do to people. And the ultimate proof is not in some kind of big study. The ultimate proof is in all of us, right? I can show you all this. But like, honestly, who hasn't done these sort of diets, right? My guess is like 90% of the entire population of North America has been on some kind of diet like this at some point in their lives. And it didn't work, right? That's just the truth, right? And this is the problem, right? The problem is that you need to know which way you're going. And the problem is insulin, because that's what tells the body which way to go, right? Insulin tells the body to store fat. That's what its normal job is, right? When you eat, insulin goes up and you start to store fat, right? You're not breaking any laws of thermodynamics. So what we see is that if you look at it from a hormonal obesity point of view, right? If you're trying to really understand the etiology of obesity, what you see is that it's still too many calories in the end, right? That's the proximate cause. That's not the ultimate cause. The ultimate cause is the insulin. 
And if that is the ultimate cause, forget about this eat less, move more. That's not going to be successful any more than drink less alcohol is more successful. The ultimate treatment is to lower insulin. Now that you understand, now you can design rational treatments, right? So what's the evidence that insulin actually makes you fat? Well, there's all kinds of association studies, but the problem with association studies is that they don't tell you anything, right? What you need are causation studies, and to do that, you have to give people stuff, like insulin. So this is the DCCT trial, right? So this is type 1 diabetics, and what they did is they had a group which had a lot of insulin and low blood sugars, and another group which had not that much insulin and higher blood sugars. Now, the group that had tight blood sugar controls did have less complications, but that's not my question, right? My question is, does that insulin make you fat? And it does. So at the end of 10 years, 9 years, you can see that the people who got lots of insulin, like almost 30% of them had major weight problems, right? So I'm not saying that they shouldn't get it. I'm just saying that here's an actual causation study. We gave the insulin, they got fat. You can look at the correlation between the total insulin dose and how much weight they gain. And it turns out it's actually pretty tight, right? As you give more and more insulin, right, this is more and more insulin, you gain more and more weight. And again, as doctors, this you already know because we've all prescribed insulin and we all know it causes weight gain, right? In type 2 diabetes, you see exactly the same thing. So this was the UK PDS. So again, another trial where they gave people lots of drugs to control the blood sugars. And another drug, another arm, which didn't get as much drug and had worse blood sugars. But again, that's not my question. My question is, does all this insulin make you fat? And once again, you see that it is. So the intensively treated group, which got a lot more insulin and a lot more drugs that stimulate insulin, gain more weight. So again, once again, moving us out of the correlation side, these are direct causal inferences, right? There's a fascinating study uh, done uh, in 1993 where they took these type 2 diabetics and they started off with no insulin, right? And they said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just amp up the insulin, okay? Give them a lot of insulin. Their sugars are going to be beautiful, right? And what they did was that they went from zero to at the beginning, they're not taking any insulin. By six months, they're taking 100 units a day, right? Their sugars are really, really well controlled. But what happens to their weight? Again, you can see there's a steady rise, right? 93, 97, 100, 102. So we're not talking again about correlations. We gave insulin, people gained weight. And what was actually interesting about this trial in particular was that they actually looked at how many calories they were eating. And the number of calories that they ate was reduced by about 300 calories per day, 250, 300. So even as they lost, even as they took less and less calories, right, they should have been losing weight according to the calorie theory, they gained like 20 pounds. So you're eating less calories and gaining 20 pounds. What's happening? Well, you're giving insulin. Insulin's telling your body, store fat, store fat. That's its job, right? So what's going to happen is your body's going to ramp down your metabolism until you store that fat, right? because that's what its job is. So you see the same thing with metformin. Metformin is a very interesting drug because it, doesn't, it blocks gluconeogenesis and doesn't raise insulin to the same extent. And what you find with that drug is that you don't get the same weight gain. So you see the conventional, so the people who are just on diet control in the metformin group, they don't differ. But the ones who get sulfonylureas, so drugs that stimulate insulin make you gain weight. So it's not just injecting insulin. It's drugs that stimulate insulin do the same thing. And again, as doctors, this is not a surprise. All these drugs, which are called sulfonylureas, stimulate insulin. So it's not simply because you're injecting it, it's exogenous. It's that when you, when you stimulate your own pancreas to release it, you gain weight. And the thing is that the, the other, the flip side, is that if insulin is what's making you gain weight, then if your insulin goes down, you would predict that you would lose weight. And that's exactly what happens. So this is a slide Eric showed. So as your insulin goes down and down and down, what happens? 
you can't gain weight, right? The classic description of type 1 diabetes is a melting down of flesh and limbs into urine, right? It's a wonderful description. Um, but <laughs> because you just lose everything. No matter what you eat, you can give them anything. You can give them, no matter what you give them to eat, they have no insulin. So they have no signal to store fat. They lose all their body fat and they die. And that's unfortunately what happened until insulin came along. And there's a, a, a disease called diabulimia, which is an um, eating disorder where type 1 diabetics will deliberately underdose their insulin, right? So they, their sugars go up and, you know, they could die of ketoacidosis. There's all kinds of problems, right? So why do people do it? Because they lose weight. They know it. We know it. When you cut their insulin, their weight goes down. And recently, there's another drug which has done, shown the same thing. So these are the SGLT2s. So until recently, there were no other drugs really to lower insulin. But this drug, which is a new drug that's approved for type 2 diabetes, actually shows that you can lower insulin levels, right? It makes you pee out the sugar, and your insulin levels go down. So these two groups, the DAPA group, are the two groups that have this drug. And you can see that their insulin goes down, right? And what happens? Well, their weight goes down, right? And what's fascinating to me, so these are the three DAPA groups. So all of them showed weight loss. And what's fascinating to me, really, when I look at something like this, is that you can follow these people out longer to a year, two years, even four years now. And that weight stays off, right? And this is fascinating, because if you look at virtually every single diet study available, People's weight goes back up at around six months. It goes down. We all know this, right? It goes back up. It doesn't. Why? Because you've lowered the insulin, right? So calorie reduction, so some people say, well, it's because you're peeing out sugar and you're losing calories. But calorie-reduced diets don't do the same thing. But when you lower insulin, which is the ultimate cause of obesity, that weight goes down and stays down, which never happens. And that's what's really fascinating about it. So you can look at a list of medications for type 2 diabetes. So there are certain ones that increase the, the effect of insulin or insulin itself, right? Insulin, sulfonylureas, TZDs, which are uh, another class of drugs. They don't raise insulin, but they raise the insulin effect. There are drugs that don't really affect insulin levels, metformin, these DPP-4s. And there are drugs that decrease insulin. So acrobose to a small degree, and these new SGLT2 inhibitors. And you can look at the weight effect as well. And it's identical, right? Stuff that raises insulin makes you gain weight. Stuff that lowers insulin makes you lose weight. So again, this is strong evidence that the hormonal view of obesity is much more correct. Because it's the obesity, it's the insulin which leads to the obesity, which leads to the compensations that we see. Right? These are hormonal effects. You're hungry because your body is increasing the ghrelin. You're decreasing your metabolism. You're not burning it off. Right? And this is the whole thing. That sets you up. It says you don't get fat because you're overeating. You're overeating because you're getting fat, right? which sets you up for the proper question, what's making you get fat? What's the ultimate cause of obesity? And again, it's insulin. Now, cortisol does play a role, but that's for another time. And what's interesting, really, is that that doesn't, um, you know, we think that we're really smart, right, in 2016. But if you go back to William Banting, he understood that refined carbohydrates led to obesity, right? So refined, and now in 2016, after this kind of 50-year hiatus where we're talking about calories, now we realize that refined carbohydrates increase your insulin, which leads to the obesity. And this guy, Banting, was in the 1850s, right? Like 150 goddamn years ago, they knew this, right? It's like, oh my god, we're not that smart. So this is the whole problem, right? If you try to treat it as a caloric deficiency, and you say that it's a personal choice, you're going to fail, right? If you understand that this is a disease which is related to insulin, then you understand why you treat it the way we do. So 
what raises insulin the most from a dietary standpoint? Refined carbohydrates, right? The sugars, the refined grains. What raises it the least? Natural fats, right? Olive oil, avocado, butter. So Marty Kendall, who's done some pretty amazing work, actually mapped this out. So he's kind of looked at any research done on the food insulin index. And what he found was that you can actually predict what the effect of insulin is um, based on the net carbs plus half of protein, right? But that still only explains about 54% of the variance. But that's as good as it gets now. So again, the net carbs, right, which is carbohydrates minus fiber, and half of the protein, which again explains why we give the advice that we do. Low carbohydrate, moderate protein, and high in natural fats, right? And what, what's amazing about, you know, conferences like this is that this really gives us a new hope because as long as we misunderstood the cause of obesity, we were doomed, right? We couldn't succeed. There was no possible way you could succeed in treating obesity. Then you get type 2 diabetes, then you go blind, then you go on dialysis, and all these problems, right? But what this uh, new understanding is, it gives us a new hope because now we can say, wow, I know what's happening here. It's your insulin. So let me say, what can I do to lower your insulin, right? We can do this, we can do that. There are low carb diets, there's fiber, for example, there's uh, vinegar, there's, um, you know, uh, intermittent fasting. There's all these different strategies that you can now use which will be successful. And that is the most important thing is that, you know, this is not, you know, a condemnation of what we've done, right? This is to tell you that this is a new dawn. As long as you understand what causes obesity, we can treat it. We just need to get the message out there. We need to get people on our side and do it. Thank you very much.